this picture right here, I drew this a day after my head surgery. I asked his pediatrician, well, don't you have other patients like him? And he said, no. no. And he had been in practice <laughs> for a long time. I have been to every major hospital in the tri-state area. AI DuPont Children's Hospital, that's where I went as a baby. I've been to Christiana Care, University of Pittsburgh. I've been to Mayo Clinic twice. I asked the Mayo Clinic, where do you go after this, Area 51? And they're like, well, no, you go here, NIH. This is Area 51 for medical patients. The Undiagnosed Disease Program started in 2008. We've seen probably about 300 individuals and we've acquired all sorts of phenotyping information. So symptoms, signs, laboratory results, x-rays, things of that sort. So, and we now have files on all those individuals. We've also collected specimens from them, including blood and cells and DNA. And so we're now poised to find out what their uh, defects might be. And in fact, in several cases, we have found out their defects. GPs all over the USA refer patients to Bill Gahl's unit when every other effort at diagnosis has failed. Eyes all the way to your knees, and we're going to see if that muscle looks normal. From early in her infancy, Miriam Morgan has suffered from unexplained problems. Miriam is a now 10-year-old little girl who was born um, of Egyptian parents who had a normal, healthy male child and had lost a female um, child at the age of four years old. So when Miriam was born, she was identified as having some unusual um, contractures of her middle fingers, very similar to what her sister had looked like. And so immediately at birth, everyone was concerned that she may have something similar. We don't know what is causing Miriam's muscle problem. It is unique in um, one specific regard in that she is normal cognitive functioning. So her brain has not been impacted. She's very intelligent. She's able to talk. She just is not able to care for herself because her muscles are so weak. It's undiagnosed. We know it's 100% genetically related disease because of the family relations and stuff like that. Miriam, she was premature. She stayed in the hospital two weeks after she born. And she was okay until mm -hmm. like two months old. And she started to have um, a lot of problems. She has a G-tube in her stomach for most of her feedings and her medications, and she's on a ventilator for breathing. So, so her muscle function is very compromised. She has the ability to type with one finger. She has a speaking computer that she'll type into, and there's a slight delay, but you'll get complete sentences from her. Did I cry, Mom? No, you don't. It was okay. We did that in your behalf. <laughs> The undiagnosed disease program has both adults and children, and probably it's about 60% adults and 40% children. Slow down, Miriam. Don't go fast. Mm. Because it's slow. Children will often have congenital disorders, genetic disorders, developmental disorders, neurological diseases, and present early. So we're able to generally apply genetic algorithms towards finding their disorder. Miriam has typical findings in that she has delays in her development and she also has a neurological disorder, in this case affecting the muscle. So she has a, a myopathy and she's been biopsied on two occasions and uh, that can sometimes be informative of something like uh, a mitochondrial disorder. Part of the Undiagnosed Diseases Program is an attempt to survey all the possible causes for a disease that has not been understood by medicine traditionally, which mostly involves things like acquiring a large number of patients and then doing statistical things like epidemiology.
Okay? We're interested in looking at the rare one-off type of disease, okay, which could be caused by anything, but my role in this is to look at a potential genetic cause. All I have is a really short record here. I don't have your whole chart. Right. So can you sort of summarize what's been going on? Well, well I have a rare undiagnosed calcium disorder which has okay. no name. I've had kidney stones since okay. I was 13, severe bone loss and weight loss. Every year is the new problem. The way Dr. Kim at Johns Hopkins described it to me is it's like a house with a broken thermostat. The heat's always on. Okay. They called it a constellation of idiosyncratic, un <laughs> unrelated symptoms, and they, had, they couldn't find anything that tied it all together, but they're still not sure what the whole puzzle looks like yet. The pieces are scrambled. I have a video when I first developed Tourette's. It's a home video of me fishing. I was about nine years old, and my head was jerking, and nobody knew what it was. And you can see that there was clearly something wrong with me and people were looking at that kid like, oh, you know, he's got a problem. You mean that shake in his head? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, there's something wrong. With it. A classic approach would be to take symptomatology and let that symptomatology inform how we should pursue an investigation. Those clues have probably been pursued by medical professionals to a certain extent already. Then we can take another approach, which is to not be influenced in our genetic pursuit by symptomatology at all. In other words, to look de novo at the contingent of genes that might be affected by examining all the genes. Okay. And we do that by a couple of different techniques. One is this million SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism array. And the other is to do whole exome sequencing on, on family members. With common diseases, genetic analysis can be done on thousands of patients. But in the case of unknown and very rare diseases, the only relevant group is a patient's wider family. Yeah, Jeff's father's aunt aunt um, had ovarian cancer. It sounds like on when his she mother's was, side, right? When she was in her thirties, mm -hmm. and um, ovarian cancer itself is fairly rare. It's even more rare to have it that young, and so that's sort of um, potentially suggestive of an, a hereditary breast and ovarian cancer gene syndrome being inherited in the family? The traditional way of looking at the human genome was by uh, making cell preparations and examining the chromosomes where the genes are contained. If you recognize that you are looking at 21,000 elements of heredity all packed together, it is somewhat like trying to spot an open parking space on a street in London uh, from a spy satellite. There are at least 21,000 coding genes, of which at least half of them have been associated with known human diseases, and uh, anyone could be the cause in a variation of the diseases we're looking at. For years, Bill Gahl and his colleagues had hunted down genes, such as that which caused HPS, a rare disease found in Puerto Rico, using very laborious observations of these marker bands in chromosomes. But very recently, totally new ways of analyzing genetic material have been introduced. SNP arrays, or chips, for example, take snapshots of the DNA at around one million regularly spaced points along the genome. We all have 3.2 billion bases. Of, of DNA. So when you do a million SNP array, you have chosen a million out of that 3.2 billion wow. specifically and a priori. And it's the same million every time you do it on every patient. Using SNP chips, we can see individual deletions of uh, parts of a gene um, as small as one tenth the entire length of a gene. So here is that entire chromosome, and each one of these colors is the smallest band. The two lines on the inside and the outside would represent one one-hundredth of just this band right here. Here are all the individual SNP dots, and they center around the number zero here in a normal individual. If, on the other hand, we look at the SNP chip from a person with disease, in this region, which is only one-third of this interval, we can see that there is a group of these SNPs, meaning a region of this chromosome, which are deleted. 
You can have a single deletion or you can have a double deletion. You can also have three strands, which would be a duplication. But any one of those things, a single deletion, a double deletion, or a duplication is called a copy number variant. And all of us are supposed to have several of those, like six or seven copy number variants. But of that entire 3.2 billion bases, only 2% are associated with genes. And we know, because of the Human Genome Project, exactly where those genes are. The SNP chip techniques allow researchers to drill down to the parts of the DNA which really matter. Because we have all the human genes annotated, we can look directly below here to the region of the genes that are deleted, and here there are only two. And to make matters much easier, they actually list what the name of the gene is and what the disease is. Using this approach, Dr. Gall's research in Puerto Rico would have been very much easier. If we had SNP chips 15 years ago, it would have taken less than three weeks to find the gene that had been the cause of the disease that uh, Dr. Gall had worked on for the better part of two decades of his life. It's important to know that the, uh, the decrement in cost of looking at uh, genes on this level um, have gone down approximately 20-fold in the last two years on the SNP chip level, but they've gone down 10,000-fold, even faster than the price of computer chips has declined over the last decade. One of my biggest and really toughest jobs is to go in um, early uh, in meeting a family or a patient and reducing their expectations. I'm doubting if I should ever have kids or not. That's why I'm asking. If you could even. Yeah, if I even could. I'm doubting whether I really should or not because what I want to pass on what I have. And I'm even more afraid of losing my brain functions and abilities because, you know, like they're just, you only reach like a certain point where, you know, you're just, you just, you don't feel like a human being anymore. And like, I don't ever want to get to that point. Mariam got uh, a lot of genes from her dad. She has a strong uh, personality, very strong personality. So that's why we get along together. And right now it's raining. Right now it's raining? Mm. Raining where? Raining is not here, man. This is snow. Well, I hope one day Dr. Tef to give me a call and tell me. Guess we what? got it. Guess what? <laughs> we found it out. <laughs> and uh, but I, I'm still. Um, I know uh, maybe they can't found anything. But uh, we go day by day, and whatever Miriam she need, we give her help. And um, whatever God give us, we accept it. Patience when they're faced with these desperate situations, are happy to have an explanation, even though the explanation portends a bad prognosis. They, they, they want knowledge in a way more than even a treatment. Every time I go in the hospital, I, I ask the doctors to tell me in detail what they're gonna do, why they're doing it, and everything, just because I like to know. Yeah, well, that's... You know, I'd rather know the truth and be upset about it, then never know the truth and, and you know. We fail even when we do a whole exome sequencing because we're unable to reduce the 15,000 variants to one. And uh, sometimes there will be, you know, multiple genes that have uh, bona fide mutations in them and we don't know which one's causative because there's so many genes I mean, that uh, will have uh, mutations in them that we can't tell which one is causing that particular disease. You know, so because of the function of all of those genes isn't even known. In fact, it's very difficult to have a, a job in which you fail 80, 85 percent of the time. And you have to pretty much acknowledge that every time you see a patient. A lot of people don't want to do that. <laughs>